God bless you and welcome to Ask the Pastor. I'm your host today, Brandon Hollis. I'm certainly excited that we have this opportunity to share with you all of our faithful partners who allow us to come into your homes week after week, day after day. We want to say thank you. We are live right now, so please pull out your phone, text somebody, call somebody, and let them know Ask the Pastor is on where you can get all your questions in to us. These pastors are ready with all of the answers because we have the Word of God. Now, here's the way that you can get those questions in to us. You can email us at ask at tct.tv. If you want to just watch us live on Facebook, we're over there. Put your question in that comment section. We'll get it just the same. Or just pick up the phone and call us at 1-800-331-3552. Well, who's going to be answering your questions? I'm glad you asked. I have with me today Apostle Lawana Ware, The Kingdom Connection. Pastor Joseph Collini, Strongsville Christian Church. Pastor David Hughes II, Fellowship Missionary Baptist Church. Pastor Nick Lindsay, Growing Together. And Pastor Jonathan Blake Turner, Israelite Missionary Baptist Church. Ladies and gentlemen, we're jumping into our first question. It's coming from Paul in Missouri, and that question is this. What does John chapter 3, verse 13 mean? Apostle Luana. Thank you very much for your inquiry, Paul. I'm going to go ahead and read John 3 and 13. Matter of fact, I'm going to read John 3 and 12 first. If I have told you earthly things and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? 13 reads, And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. Now, my understanding for this word of God is that none of us as earthly teachers um, have ever been to heaven before. However, um, Jesus the Christ, Son of Man, Son of God, has actually been both from heaven to earth. He had ascended to heaven, so he ha has tasted of both worlds, both understandings, and so he holds more, more weight in understanding than we do. Right. And so, as a result, his, te his testimony matters more than ours. Mm. His, um, his glorified word matters more than ours. So who better than anyone can give us the understanding of what heaven really means? Wow, thank you for that. Pastor Joseph, what do you say? I think she did a great job answering that. Um, and so what I could look at what's happening is I want to read um, 13 and 14. It says, and no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that come from heaven, even the son of man, which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so even so must the son of man be lifted up. So what Jesus was doing was actually prophetic in his statement. And he was declaring that he was going to be lifted up in the same way that Moses lifted up the staff that was curled with the snake. And when the people looked at it, they got healed of a venomous snake bite. Well, mm -hmm. when Jesus went up to the cross, we were stung by the sting of sin. Right. And when we look upon Jesus and what he did on that cross, we too likewise will be healed Hallelujah. at the name of Jesus. So it was prophetic and it was also building up his credibility. As Pastor Lawana said, I can read a book about Florida. I can explain it academically, but Jesus, Jesus was born in Florida, and so he was saying, I have been to where you're trying to get to. There is no one else who has more credibility because I come from there, and so I'm telling you from personal experience. And he was building up credibility to Nicodemus, who was questioning or curious, and so he removed all doubt when he was lifted up. Wow, this is good wisdom. Pastor David, what do you say to this? Yeah, that's great. And just to piggyback off of my colleagues, what I'll say is that just Jesus had unrestricted access. Mm -hmm being um, the Word of God, being the Son of God, being God in the flesh. We know that Enoch was translated, so he was taken up to heaven um, before he actually physically died. Um, and we also know that Elijah was also taken up to heaven, but they did not have to have unrestricted access. They first had to be translated so that the um, fleshly things can turn eternal um, or however that works. But Jesus don't, doesn't have to do all that. He could just, you know, he could go up and down unrestricted access um, whenever he fe felt like it. Obviously, he did stay here for 33 years, you know, consecutively to do the will of the Father, but that's what he's talking about, the unrestricted access into heaven. Thank you for that. And of course, that question again from Paul is, what does John chapter 3 verse 13 mean? What do you have to say, Pastor Nick? 
I would say the panel has handled this so incredibly well. And I want to bring a, a little bit of a twist to it uh, just to bring something else for you to think on. Uh, he talks about himself having, of course, been from heaven and coming down from heaven, but he also then finishes that verse, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. When Jesus spoke and he taught, people would literally remark, uh, how does he teach with such authority? Um, wh where did he get this authority? He was operating, even though he was on this earth physically as a man, 100% God, 100% man, he was operating in the authority from the third heavens as if he was seated there even right now, which indeed is a mind-blowing concept. He was in the earth, yet he never lost a, an ounce, a fraction, a decimal of his authority in the third heavens. Mm. And as I was reading this, I was thinking about Ephesians 2, 6, and verse 5 and 6, it says of us and him, even when we were dead in sins, he hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are ye saved, that is rescued, and hath raised us up together. We've got to understand this. And made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So even still, as we are here on the earth, God has literally empowered us to operate with an authority based on being in him. Mm. Amen. Thank you for that. Pastor Jonathan, your final thoughts? Um, as previously stated, the panel has, has handled this, your question, exceptionally well, and I hope you've found some clarity. Um, just to share some final fleeting thoughts, um, I think much of our understanding of John 3.13 is found um, in the B clause of verse number two, uh, where uh, there, there's dialogue happening between Jesus and Nicodemus. Nicodemus is only mentioned in the Gospel of John. And Nicodemus shows up and says, hey, listen, um, how do I get to where you come from? In the B clause of verse two, he says, um, Rabbi or teacher, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if they were not with him. Mm -hmm. So Nicodemus shows up and starts his interview with Jesus by saying, I know you've been someplace that we haven't, and I know the position I hold here in the land, but the knowledge that you have comes from somewhere else that we cannot tap into. And so by the time we get to 13, Nicodemus has had this dialogue dialogue with Christ, and Christ is saying to him, how can you understand heavenly things when you barely have grasped the earthly things? Um, and so Jesus is teaching Nicodemus, and I believe teaching you and I, Paul, um, that there are things that happen in our lives that we can explain. There are things we got that are happening in our lives that we, the pastors, may be able to answer. But then there are things that only God can bring That's revelation right. to. Right. Then there are things that happen that we experience that only God can explain um, because he's been in the heavens, and he operates from the heavens while coexisting here in the earth. So I think that the simple thing to deduce that the panel has iterated time after time is that certainly God has a different perspective on our situations. Hallelujah. This is already getting good. And this is just the first question. Thanks for that, Paul. Uh, Leela is in Michigan and asking this question regarding John chapter 14, verse number two. Will everybody have a mansion of their own in heaven? Pastor... What do you think about this, Pastor Joseph? I hope so, because we live in a small house, and that'll definitely be an upgrade, because <laughs> it's getting tight where we're living. But, uh, you know, if we read that scripture, uh, John 14, 2, it says, in my father's house are many mansions. Mm. Now, different versions say many rooms or many houses. So if we're going with King James, it says mansion. So I want to uh, address that point. And then it says, if it were not so, I would have told you, and I go to prepare a place for you. So really, the emphasis is is that God has room for us. He, so that we don't have to uh, worry about uh, God running out of room and, you know, we're just, we get rejected from heaven. He's like, oh, we're already occupied full, you know, you know, so we don't have to worry about it. There's plenty of space and it's not God's will that any should perish. But I'm going to tell you the epitome of God is not just having a mansion. I look forward to that. I'm excited about it. I put in a request for gold trim on my mansion. Um, I don't know if that's going to happen or not, but the epitome of God God is him, is his presence. It's That's not right. going to be the mansion. The Bible says in Revelation 7 that there is an innumerable amount of people saying, holy, holy, yes. holy is God. There's angels encamped about him mm. and just worshiping the throne and Jesus who sits on the throne. So heaven is all going to be about the presence of God. But to answer my question is I say, yeah, we're going to have a mansion. I believe that. Hallelujah. I love that point. Pastor David. Yeah, so mansion, I, I know it's going to be blessed. I know it's going to be wonderful, more extravagant than anything that we have here on this earth. 
Will it be a mansion like the mansions that we have on this earth? Well, there will be a dwelling. Um, but, you know, some of the things like if we just hear the description of heaven, it says that heaven has gates that's literally made of one gigantic pearl. Um, so and then they also have streets of gold, but the gold is like transparent glass. So it's just like so amazing and mind blowing that we don't know how great this dwelling is. But one of the things that I want to share with you is the fact that a lot of the great men of God were studying in our, our church about Abraham. He lived in a tent. A lot of them lived in tents. There were people who went place to place, basically were homeless. And, and one of the things I just want to say is that is this, whether you live in, in a smaller house, a suburban house, whether you're homeless, um, you know, God has a place for us to be when we get there to heaven. So. Thank you for that. Pastor Nick. Amen. The simple answer to it is yes. He's saying directly he's going to make a dwelling place. If I understand this correctly, and I'm not even close to an expert on this, but I understand there is an element of um, when uh, the, uh, the mystery of Jesus um, being married to the church and how the husband-to-be would uh, be um, wed to his uh, soon-to-be wife, um, and he would go and prepare a place. He would go for a season and he would build uh, sometimes maybe in addition to his father's house right. where then he would come back for her and take her with him to dwell there. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's, <laughs> I can't shake this. I, I thought of Psalm 15 when I read this mm -hmm. and where David asked, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? There is a place for each one of us uh, he says, he that walketh uprightly, that worketh righteousness, that speaketh the truth in his heart, he that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. And it goes on to a number of other things. The closer in proximity we pursue and seek God's face now, I believe there is a relative parallel in heaven. And that's what I understand to be the truth, that he does prepare us a place, and I want to be as close in proximity as I can. I love Amen. that. So do I. Uh, Pastor Jonathan Leela's question from Michigan again is regarding John chapter 14, verse 2. Will everybody have a mansion of their own in heaven? So, Leela, that is a loaded question. Um, <laughs> I think we've got to understand a bit of Judaic culture. I think we have to understand a bit of Greek to really understand what the text is saying. Uh, John 14 starts with Jesus in conversation with his disciples, encouraging them about the fact that he's preparing to depart from them. Understand that his disciples were devout Jews, right? Um, he says, don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. That in my Father's house there are many mansions or there are many rooms, and in the Greek Mansions or rooms literally translates, the, the verb that's used here in the Greek translates to mean space. Um, the, the, in Judaic culture, it is believed that heaven was the habitation of God. Heaven was the place where God lived, for lack of a better phrase. And so it were that if I'm going back to live with my father, then I'll make space for you too, uh, which speaks to the life and the ministry of Christ Jesus that's making space for us in the presence of God. It's Good. the sin that separated us, that created space with us uh, being away from God, and it is the redemptive salvific work of Christ that redeems that space and time and pulls us back. I also think, just for our consideration, that it's something uniquely specific that the same Jesus who had no room when he entered the world on, is man. the same Jesus who offered room for the disciples in <laughs> the world good. that he came That's into. Good. And so, I, while I believe holistically that there is this rewarding space for us in the presence of God. I think the reward is not how big our mansion is or how materialistic our space in heaven is, but rather the fact that we have opportunity to tabernacle or dwell in the same space <laughs> where good. God is. This is good. This is good. Pastor Lawana, your final thoughts. Okay, so um, everyone answered very well. Um, in my personal opinion, I, I believe that God knows all of our hearts and in understanding that uh, well, for me, I, I need my own space. <laughs> I, I need my own space. Um, you know, the Bible says in um, Acts um, 2 and 40, um, part B, save yourself from this untoward generation. If you're asking me to save myself, why would I need to go live with a whole bunch of other people? I need my own space. 
You know, that should be my reward, is my own space. Even though we are going to worship him all day and all night, you know, um, with that understanding, when I go to rest, if rest is a requirement, you know, because our requirements change once we get to heaven. If that is a requirement, then I would like to have my own space. I don't want to be, <laughs> I don't want to share a bunk bed. I don't want to share, I don't want, I don't want to share anything. I don't want to share my shoes, none of that. You know, that all happened down here. Okay? Can we all have our own space? <laughs> <laughs> I love this already. This is only what you'll get on Ask the Pastor. We got to take a space of break, but we'll be right back with more when we return. <laughs> Did you know you can enjoy total Christian television, whether at home or on the go? That's right, all with one simple click. Watch TCT's exclusive live stream and on demand programming. Cast to your smart TV. Share episodes with your friends. Never miss a moment of your favorite programs with pause and rewind. Just for signing up and downloading the TCT app, we'll send you a great gift absolutely free. Selection will vary and supplies are limited, so don't wait another minute. Go to tct.tv, ways to watch, apps and devices to get started. Download the TCT app to get access to Total Christian Television. Do it today. You ask the questions and we provide the answers. On Ask the Pastor, we minister the Word of God as we receive your inquiries. It takes a great deal of time, effort, and finances to produce this quality Christian programming. When you support TCT, we can continue to provide biblical Christian guidance to our viewers. We can talk about Jesus all we want. Put that question in and we'll read it for you right here live on the air. Oh my goodness, my tablet is on fire. The next time you have a question and you want to know what the Bible says about about it as the pastor. Your support can make a difference in the lives of many. Go to our website at tct.tv or call us at 1-800-232-9855. You can text to give by sending TCT to 56512 or you can mail a contribution to P.O. Box 1010, Marion, Illinois, 62959. Thank you for partnering with TCT and Ask the Pastor. Welcome back. Took a very small break, but of course, we're back with live programming for you. That's what Ask the Pastor is. And I just want to encourage everyone that has been watching. You've already been blessed. We're just short time into the program, and it may be your first time watching. And you say, how do I continue to get more of this? This is really rich. Given the gospel of Jesus around the world, I want to help continue the work that TCT is doing. Several ways you can support us. You can give us a call at 800 232 988 855. If you want to write us, you can do that at P.O. Box 1010, Marion, Illinois, 62959. If you go to our website, the information is there for you. It's also a secure site where you can give there as well, tct.tv. We've made it very simple for you. You just pull out your phone and text the letters TCT to 56512. Now, this is your reminder again that we are live. And if you haven't told somebody yet, go ahead and do that. Send out a text and tell them we're live with Ask the Pastor. We've already answered so many tremendous questions that have come in. And uh, maybe you've got one you're thinking of right now. Please get it over to us. Ask at tct.tv. That's the email. Or you can watch us on Facebook. Put your question in that comment section. We'll get it right here in the studio or just call us at 800-331-3552. Now, those of you that are watching us right now on Facebook, I got your questions. I got them right here in my hand. I'm getting ready to ask the pastors. Gina, you're watching us on Facebook. And Gina's question is this, Pastor David. She said, could you explain Calvinism? Okay, 90 seconds. Um, <laughs> Well, um, I'm not an expert in Calvinism, um, and so I apologize to all of my Calvinists if I get this incorrect, but um, my belief is that um, John Calvin created a branch of Protestantism, uh, Protest a Protestant belief that people are predestined to go to heaven, meaning that God has a predetermined number to go of people who he is going to have in heaven. So the people who are saved were predetermined. They're going to be saved. They're going to stay saved and they're going to be with him 
everybody else will not. So um, that's the belief that like once you're saved, always saved, uh, as opposed to others who um, really rely on the free will of man to choose to be saved. So, or choose God, excuse me. Thank you for that. Pastor Nick, what's your take? Uh, I think perhaps he knows more about it than I do, frankly. <laughs> um, you know, I, I study the Bible. Uh, I don't study aspects of um, other religions or cults very much. Um, I, I have in the past uh, just to kind of do a review to understand what some of the beliefs are. Um, I looked it up and it says among the important elements of Calvinism are the following, uh, following the authority and sufficiency of Scripture for one to know God and one's duties to God and one's neighbor, uh, the equal authority of both Old and New Testaments. Um, it sounds like it is a uh, more or less Bible-based study, but I don't really study Calvinism. I study the Word of God. I know that Jesus Christ is my Savior, and because He died and rose again and shed His blood, I'm washed clean from my sins. I am born again in my spirit, and I am now a new creature. That's what I study. <laughs> okay. You sound like me, Pastor Nick. Pastor Jonathan, what do you say? I agree with Pastor Nick. I am, I am the same way. Uh, Calvinism is a unique reformation. Uh, right, right around the uh, early 1500s, John Calvin, um, along with many others were just branching off from the political structure that was the Catholic Church. Um, and they were breaking away from all of the religious traditions that Catholicism uh, had taught. And Calvinism was a five-point system um, that spoke of several different aspects that were in some ways contradictory uh, to other Protestant, uh, at, at, that is, non-Catholic uh, belief structures. Total depravity in that um, we all have fallen to sin. Unconditional election is where it starts to get real muddy, um, and that is um, God chose from the beginning of, of time who would be going to heaven and who would not go to heaven, which contradicts our theology of accepting Christ and accepting salvation, um, limited atonement, which is the third point of Calvinism, um, which suggests that Christ's blood is, was shed for all, but only works for a few. Oh. Um, and so there, there, and there are two other points of Calvinism, that is irresistible grace and perseverance of the saints. But in those first three points, there were some, some major contradictions. And for those who, who practice Calvinism, they often believe that they are of the elect um, that are in that number, um, and they are the ones for whom the blood of Christ will work for. Um, I, I do believe in, in, in closing that if indeed we, we start pigeoning down these rabbit holes, we'll find ourselves indoctrinating ourselves with more of how man interprets God's grace versus our own experience of God's grace. Wow. And so I would encourage you that while these things are real and while you may study them and come to know what they are and, their, and the, the tenets for which they stand, I would encourage you to dive head first into the Word of God Amen. so that John Calvin can tell you, John Wesley can't tell you, but God can express himself to you specifically, and you'll know beyond a shadow of a doubt who God is. This is good. This is good. That question again, Apostle Luana from Gina, could you explain Calvinism? Well, um, I agree um, that I never really, I did learn of it in, um, in school, in education, but never really took much task in it. Um, Calvinism really um, peaked on omniscience, which is God being all seeing and all knowing. By Him being all seeing and all knowing, it basically says what predestination is that He knows exactly who is going to make it and who is not going to make it to heaven. And but that takes away from our choice. And God gives us a choice. Uh, we're not like the angels. The angels were um, created um, only to worship Him, whereas we are beings that were given a choice, and that's what created the jealousy of Satan. But um, however, just understanding that God gives us a choice. We wake up every day with new grace and mercy. That gives us opportunity to refresh our relationship with God. So there is, if there was, um, truly uh, uh, an ability to be just 
just uh, driven only by the understanding of Calvinism, that would not be the case. We, it would simply be that when I wake up, if I was the one, the person that was chosen to go to heaven and to heaven alone, I will, will actually have no reason to repent, no reason to oh. um, be godly sorry about anything that goes on in my day. It will negate from um, the um, from the Lord's prayer where we are required to pray daily, you know, um, and not that we're required to pray that prayer daily, but simply in the order and fashion of that prayer, that we're asking for repentance for the sins that we know of and don't know of. How, how can that be that Calvinism then will work? Wow. Pastor Joseph, your final thoughts? All right. I, I'm in agreement with every one of these pastors on the panel. I have to say they do me proud. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I just think the problem with Calvinism for me is that if we go with the uh, uh, unconditional election, um, then that's almost like saying that God made robots. We don't have free will. We can't choose. And then all of the evil that takes place on this earth, it's almost like blaming God for whatever you see rather than blaming God. So, it's almost like falsely accusing God. Mm. But, you know, the Bible does teach us in Joshua 24, 15, it says, and if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your father served that were on the side of the flood mm. or the gods of the Amorites and whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Hallelujah. So I don't want to lift up or exalt any name, including myself, above the name of Jesus. So I stick with the word of God, and I don't um, subscribe to any type of uh, names or doctrines or teachings that um, could lead me away from what I see as sound doctrine from the Bible. This is good. I think the pastors did an excellent job at answering your question, Gina. Thanks for sending that in to us. Uh, Soraya, I hope I'm saying your name right, is watching on Facebook as well. Pastor Nick, this is her question, says, can somebody lose salvation? No. You can't lose your salvation. Um, definition of lose, to come to be without something in one's possession or care through accident, theft, etc., so that there is little or no prospect of recovery. 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope. That is a confidence. That is a confident, joyful expectation by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept, that is, in a military sense, guarded mm. by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. You cannot lose your salvation. Thank you, Pastor Nick. Pastor Jonathan. I uh, Pastor Nick has taken all of the words that I would ever think to say. Um, uh, to lose would suggest uh, that you've run the risk of never obtaining it again. Um, I think maybe what you're asking is there is there a way to forfeit uh, your salvation? And, and I do believe that there there is a way that you may do that. Um, but it, it's almost like the story, when I think of your question, I think of the story of the husband and the wife who uh, ride in the car uh, when they were when they first got married and the husband said um, when they first started they rode together they were really really close and then as time went on they would just get a little further and a little further and a little further and a little further and the wife finally asked the husband well uh, why is it that we're so far away and the husband replied I'm the one driving I've been here the whole time you're the one that has moved away and so in in that in that frame of thought I believe that there is that the forfeit of distance that we can create be between us and God and our salvific walk, but all the while that we may have come away from him, he's been there the entire time. Wow. That's just really good. Apostle Luana. Uh, very good. That was a very good um, response. Um, John 3, 16 states, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, who, that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. If I truly believed, how can I you know, there, there is no that um, losing my salvation. Am, am I correct? As my 
brothers as said before, there is no way that I can lose it. Because if I were truly a child of God, now, however, I can forfeit it if I decide that I no longer want to be in the face of God and turn my face mm -hmm. um, to, away from him. Um, there is people that walk away and now That's become right. atheists. That's there right. are people that walk away that say they no longer believe in God, but a person that were truly filled with the Holy Ghost and really have ate from the Father's table, how can you really, there's scripture, I believe that's in Romans, where how can you have you, if you really tasted of him, oh. if you really um, truly have seen the miracle signs and wonders and, and really have seen the things he's done in your life, how could you ever walk away from it? So, you know, then it gives the question of, were you ever really filled in the first place? Mm. Pastor Joseph, that question from Soraya, can someone lose salvation? All right, so you hit us with the most controversial uh, question here. So um, I would say this, I would, I don't see, as I said before in the past, I don't ever see anywhere in the Bible where there's a punishment for repentance or he said, hey, you repented too much. So I lean on the side of caution, Lord, forgive me and believe that he forgave me for that. I also lean on the caution uh, that the Bible does say in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, it says, let no man deceive you that in the last days there shall come a great falling away. So I I do believe that people can choose to leave God. Now, whether they were saved or not from the beginning, you know, I, I know the Bible says work out your own salvation with fear and godly trembling. We really don't need to worry about um, whether other people are saved. We need to make sure that we ourselves are saved first and foremost, and then win other people to the Lord, and then they're going to have to continue and make choices for themselves. So I do believe that, as the Bible says, uh, none will snatch us out of the hand of God. So God God um, is not going to allow someone else to mislead us or take us away from God, but we also have the choice to uh, choose to leave God if we want to, because it's not a hostage situation where he takes away our free will. Ooh, and who would ever want to leave the presence of God? Pastor David, your final thoughts. Yeah, thank you. Um, like, let me just read some scriptures before I comment. Like uh, Pastor Kalini said, Philippians 2 and 12 says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And then 1 Corinthians 9, 27 says, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Uh -huh. Second Timothy 4 and 10 says this, for Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world and has departed for Thessalonica and everything like that. So, um, and, but then there's scriptures like this in Philippians 1 and 6, it says, um, he who have begun a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So for that, that's why this is so controversial. We don't know. There's some things that I say are above my pay grade. Mm -hmm. You know, I just want to make sure that I'm right with God. So I'm going to try to do my best, and if I fall short, repent, and everything like that. And I'm going to allow all of these um, things, other things, to be worked out because God has the power to know whether He knew I was going to stay saved my entire the entire time I was saved, or whether I'll fall away. So I'm just going to worry about myself and let God be God and let me be me. Amen. Thank you for that question. And you can just do like me, Soraya. Every week I say that prayer over and over again. So if I did lose it, I get it back every week. <laughs> Brianna is watching us on Facebook, uh, Pastor Turner, and her question is this. Do you feel that some Christians abuse grace? Ooh, oh, my. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Um, I believe that it is our humanistic sin nature mm -hmm. to take advantage of things that we didn't pay for. Mm, wow. I think it is the epitome of the metaphorical father-child relationship Yes. for us to take advantage of the thing that the father gives us because the child had no investment in it. Oh. I'm, certainly, I'm certain we can all recall a time uh, in our lives where we were given something that we did not value. Um, Paul says, when I was a child, I 
thought as a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child. And in the Greek, that last one is lagitsomai. And lagitsomai literally means to assign weight or importance to things. And so he said in his text that um, when I was a child, I put importance on the things that didn't matter, mm -hmm. and I didn't value the things that did. And so when it comes to grace and the fact that God loves us enough to forgive us and give us mercy and withhold punishment from us uh, that we so rightfully deserve, we often get, get caught up in the in the fact that, oh, I can do it and I'll just repent because I, I'm not going to lose my salvation. Uh -huh. um, but there comes a time in our spiritual walk where maturity kicks in and we say, I, I know that God will forgive me for it, but I don't, I don't want to have to ask him to. I know God will forgive me for it, but I don't, I don't want to disappoint him again. I know God will forgive me for it, but I don't want to go through the work of disconnecting from what I was never supposed to be connected to. So yes, we do abuse grace. I believe more when we're young Christians um, than we do when we mature in Christ, knowing that my life is to please you. Oh. And if my aim is to please God, it's to do everything that I can to avoid the things that would cause distance between him and I. So then when I do fall short, and I will, grace comes into play to save me, not grace being used as an excuse to live how I want to live. Ooh. Brianna, you have tapped into something heavy here, and I got to hear from all the pastors, but we got to take this very small break. We'll be right back. You know, God is the God that created everything. He created us. I think we must really make sure that we have the intimacy with the Father. We need to widen our understanding. And Jesus is the door to the Father. He's the, the all in all. Everything that's in this word, this, this is our religion. And wisdom operates best in love. I think that you should pray directly for everything. We have received forgiveness from God. You live your life the way God said to live it, and he will support you in that. In other words, you might only be raggedy like a dog, but you're alive and there's still hope for you. Satan is under the control of God. He can do no more than what God allows him to do. They have God's power at their fingertips, but they choose to be oppressed by the devil. You can be set free. One thing that probably hinders our blessing the most is that we don't ask. If you ask for it, you will receive that gift. I'm not gonna be stranded with this. I'm gonna call in and ask the pastor. Did you know you can enjoy total Christian television, whether at home or on the go? That's right, all with one simple click. Watch TCT's exclusive live stream and on-demand programming. Pass to your smart TV. Share episodes with your friends. Never miss a moment of your favorite programs with pause and rewind. Just for signing up and downloading the TCT app, we'll send you a great gift absolutely free. Selection will vary and supplies are limited, so don't wait another minute. Go to tct.tv, ways to watch, apps and devices to get started. Download the TCT app to get access to Total Christian Television. Do it today. When you plant seed in the ground, you can expect a harvest, especially when you plant it in good soil. TCT is good soil, and I encourage all of you that are watching today uh, to plant into this ground. What are we doing here? We're not just doing something uh, because we don't have anything better to do. We're doing it because we believe in this gospel. We believe that it is so rich that it should go around the world. That's what TCT does. Give us a call today, 800-232-9855. Certainly you can write us at P.O. Box 1010, Marion, Illinois, 62959. Go to our website. You can even rewatch some of our programming there, tct.tv. It's also a secure site. Or just text the letters TCT to 56512. All of you that are just now tuning in, you've missed some tremendous questions and some excellent answers. But if you're just now tuning in, we've got more for you. And if you're thinking of a question that you want us to answer, you can get that into us as well. You can email us at ask at tct.tv. 
post your question in the Facebook uh, line there and we'll get it just the same. Or just give us a call at 1-800-331-3552. Now, Facebook is literally on fire today. They are sending in some amazing questions, but these pastors are not bending. They're coming right back with the Word of God. Now, before we went on break, Brianna sent a question in from Facebook, said, do you feel that some Christians abuse grace? We heard from Pastor Turner, and I've got to hear from you, Apostle. What do you say? Okay, Brianna, um, I want to put a little spin on it. Perhaps... Grace and mercy was given to us to take advantage of. Um, God, the uncreated, created us with the understanding that he put us in an imperfect suit. This imperfect suit, although after we've given our life over to Christ, we still wear it. And so because we still wear this suit, it requires that we rehearse and go through life um, dealing with life situations that is imperfect. The, the suit is imperfect, life is imperfect, the environment we're in is imperfect. And so as we grow, as my brother, uh, Pastor Turner stated, that um, we, we become more wise in the decisions that we make. Mm. So he wants us to take advantage of the, of the membership or the, the, the amenities of the uh, membership that we have. And one of the um, amenities is that grace and mercy is fresh every day. Oh. And so instead of us saying, well, I don't want to repent because I've been found here yesterday. I don't want to repent because I'm tired of going to God about the same thing. God said, I'm encouraging you to repent. Wow. I'm encouraging you to take advantage of grace. I'm encouraging you to um, utilize the amenities I've given you until you're able to get it right. I always find it better to ask for forgiveness than to continue on That's my thing. in sin. Pastor Joseph, what do you say? Mm -hmm. I appreciate the point of uh, Pastor Lawana. Um, you know, if you never did anything wrong, then you never need grace. That's right. Um, but um, so I'm going to come from two different angles here. Um, Paul said in Romans 6, 1, he said, what shall we say then? Shall we continue to sin that grace shall abound? And then he says, God forbid, how shall we that are dead in sin any longer live longer therein? And I always say um, from a perspective as someone who was in, uh, uh, someone who really loved to sin, I feel like I mastered the art of sin and I mastered the art of pleasure and I did all kinds of uh, wicked things that God has forgiven me and set me free from. And now, after he set me free, I understand the pleasure that you can get in God is greater than the pleasure you can get in sin. And so a lot of times that people sin is because they're hurting, they're suffering, um, they don't know another way, and they haven't really experienced the pleasure of God. And so the Bible says in Psalm 1611, it says, uh, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is the fullness of joy, and at thy right hand and our pleasures forevermore. So I really believe if someone is taking advantage of grace per se so that they could keep sinning, it's only because they have not tasted yet oh. and seen that God is good. And not only is he good, he's endlessly better than anything the devil can have to offer us. His peace is amazing and past all understanding. His joy gives us strength. And I want to encourage you to get to a place in God where you no longer crave after sin, but you crave after him. I love that. I love that. Pastor David, what do you have to say to this? Yeah, I remember watching this movie and it was like a demon was attacking this guy. And so he had like the star of David, then that didn't work. So he moved over to like this Hindu symbol. Then he moved to the cross of Jesus. And I just think some people don't understand grace. Like they look at grace as fire insurance. You know, the grace of God will keep me out of hell if I accept Jesus Christ. The truth of the matter is, is that grace is the starting point of uh, our destination to get to the fullness of Christ. Let me just read you Titus 2, 11 through 13 or 11 and tw uh, 12. It says this, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodly and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously and godly in this present age. So the grace of God should teach us that because of what Christ has done for us, now we should become more like him and we should um, serve him not out of obligation like the law, but out of appreciation for what he has done for us on the cross. This is good. Pastor Nick, do you feel that some Christians abuse grace? <clears throat> um, I think that we all have 
at some point. Um, the very best chapter of the Bible that I could point someone to to start searching this out is Romans chapter 6. Uh, it actually brings it up as that wording twice. Um, one of the verses is um, uh, verse 15, what then shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid, know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his, shall I say, slaves, uh, ye are to whom ye obey. Whether of sin unto death, it's just going to usher in corruption and death into our lives if we obey sin, if we yield to sin, or to obedience unto righteousness. It also says in this chapter that sin shall not have dominion over us anymore because of the work of Christ. I will tell you, um, I can't be concerned about anyone but myself primarily, and then those whom I have authority over, meaning my family and, of course, my ministry. I am deeply concerned for uh, all, all believers, but I have to speak for myself. I refuse to be a slave to sin, and I refuse to be a slave to Satan, so I will not take advantage, so to speak, of grace. I'm not, I'm too busy allowing God to purify my heart, and it hurts sometimes. And sometimes yeah. I feel broken, and sometimes I cry yeah. over my own stuff. Uh -huh. I'm too busy with that to take advantage of the grace, the influence of God's love on my heart. Ooh, There's no way I want to do that. Mm. I don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. I don't want to quench him. I want to lay hands on folks, and I want to see the power of God work and move through me. I want to be able to speak and influence God, God's influence in people's yes. lives. I don't, I don't want to be uh, impure. I don't want to be a slave to sin anymore. And so that's my motivation. I don't know about anyone else, but Absolutely. I just can't go there. Amen. After hearing Pastor Nick, it's certainly a heart condition. Brianna, thank you for that question. Joyce is asking a question, Apostle Luana. She said, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, but when were the angels and the devil created? Um, very good. Genesis um, 1 and 1 expels this information. In the beginning, God created the heavens and all its contents and then the earth. So in the heavens were the angels created. And so um, I believe that's when the angels were created. It does not give in the Word of God an exact time, uh, time frame or scene in which the angels were created or identified. So um, this is the best uh, answer that could be given is when um, the heavens were created. Pastor Joseph. I'm not going to preach or teach a sermon on this topic anytime soon, possibly never. Um, but I'm going to tell you just what it looks like to me um, in Genesis chapter 3, uh, verses 1. It says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God hath made, and said unto the woman, Yeah, hath God said, Ye shall not eat uh, of the tree of the garden. This is talking about the devil talking to uh, Eve. And so it looks like that man was created. But before that, it looks like uh, the Lu Lucifer was there because he was roaming around. So whether they were created at the same time, I really don't know to say uh, conclusively, but I would say it looks like that um, the devil was there before man is my guess. And I'm just going to leave it at a guess. Thank you for that. Pastor David. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. So um, let me just go to Ezekiel 28, and it's just talking about, like, uh, history of uh, Lucifer, and it says, um, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Then it talks about um, you were the anointed guardian cherub, and then it talks about um, you are blameless in your ways for the day you, um, from the day you were created um, till wickedness was found in you. So um, we don't know the exact, like we obviously we can't give an exact date when um, the angels and Lucifer were created, but they were created at a point in time. And that's the difference between God. Uh, one of the differences, the great differences between God um, and, and the angels and Satan, which Satan learned the hard way that God was here you know, he's from everlasting to everlasting. Thou art God. He who is, who was, who is to come. So God was here from the beginning. The angels and Lucifer were created at a certain point in time. Thank you for that. A Joyce question again. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But when were the angels and the devil created, Pastor Nick? 
Yeah, so I really appreciate how the panel has handled this. Um, you know, there's places where bi the Bible is really, really clear about specifics about things, and then there are times where there are things where there are not the specifics that maybe we would want it to be. Um, but there is uh, an interesting scripture in Job 38. I'll just read a few verses here real quick. Where the, wh he, This is God talking to Job, I believe. It's, uh, where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare, if thou hast understanding, who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest, or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened, or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Um, I'm not going to die on this mountain, but I do believe that somehow the angels were created in time enough to witness uh, some of God's creation. And so based on scripture, I believe that this is evidence of that. That's all I have to say about that. Good. Thank you. Pastor Jonathan, your final thoughts. Yeah, um, first of all, the panel has been exceptionally well handling questions. I love questions like these um, because they challenge us to dig uh, beyond our faith and they challenge us to rely on our faith. Uh, the short answer is we don't know. Uh, so let me lead with that. However, let me offer you a couple of things for consideration. Genesis 1-1 says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, period. Genesis 2 says, now the earth. So there's a space and time between verse 1 and verse 2 where there is potentially some other creation, but Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 starts talking about the creation of the earth. And so we also have to take into consideration that Genesis is not listed, it's not written in chronological order. The Bible is not listed in chronological order. Um, and so these are things for us to consider. Uh, the Bible is clear um, that some things happened from the foundation of the world, right? Ephesians chapter one and four uh, says, even as he chose him before the foundations of the world, which would precede the beginning of the beginning, right? Uh, so God does not operate in our formation of time. Genesis one starts when our time starts. It doesn't start when God's time starts. And so things for us to consider as it pertains to when, when the angels and when Lucifer were created, that the text that was read from Job 38, there illicitly alludes to the fact that the angels were there cheering God on right. as he's calling the heavens and the sky and dividing the firmament and right. speaking the water. And so we can presume with as much hermeneutical suspicion as possible that at some point in time between Genesis 1 chapter 1, verse 1, and chapter 1, verse 2, that God did some creating of angels and ethereal beings beyond our, our understanding that were there to celebrate the creation of the world that we live in and the time that we exist in outside of the time that God existed in, because he too is from everlasting to everlasting. Good, good, good. Joyce, you have definitely made these pastors dig in, and we thank you for that question. Carolyn is on Facebook watching uh, Pastor Joseph, and she said, said, what does it mean when God tells you to keep the light on? And how do you do that? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm glad that this question came to me because I do specialize in light. I understand that the human eye detects 380 to 760 nanometers in which the brain perceives the light. This is kind of my field in which I work in. Um, so there is light that is available, but that doesn't mean everyone sees it. And sometimes wow. we need to have those glasses or those lenses to redirect that light into the retina so that the brain perceives it. But it's always there, just not everyone one sees it. And so I get excited when we talk about light because Jesus said, I am the light. And so in first John chapter one, verses six, it says, if we say that we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. And then the verse before it says, this then is the message uh, which have heard and declared unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So you can see there's a comparison between the light and the truth. Truth. And the more truth of God's word that you lock, walk into, the more light of God that you walk into. Oh, I believe that. Pastor David. Yeah, it says, let your light so shine before men so that they may see your good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. And, you know, so maybe some people or yourself a little secretive, you know, don't 
uh, want to uh, show uh, the things that you're doing. And yeah, sometimes you should do things in secret so you'll be rewarded openly. But other than that, I just think that, you know, let people see, you know, yourself, your testimony, um, how you live. And also, um, don't allow that light to be put out. Sometimes the devil will want to put that light out, but, but, but keep it burning for the Lord. Amen. Pastor Nick, I'm going to shift on you. Uh, Sherry is watching on Facebook. How many times can we get married? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the covenant of God for a man and a woman, he intended from the very beginning, Jesus said plainly, it's for one time, is, is the idea that God started. That is the ideal, that is the covenant that God said a man should be cleaved unto his, unto his wife, and they should become one and let no man separate. Um, having said that, we live in an per imperfect world. Even Jesus, when he was teaching this, he alluded back to, you know, they said, well, Moses said, and he said, listen, God, God gave some permissive things for Moses to set into place because your hearts were so hard, uh, you wouldn't listen to me. Uh -huh. you, wouldn't, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't take the same... Uh, understanding and the same value of what it is to make covenant with someone that I told you to. Wow. Uh, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> wow. Thank you for that. I wish we had more time to dig into that a little bit more and hear from these pastors, but that's been our time for today. And certainly we want to thank everyone that sent in every question. And I've got to thank this amazing panel that was on with us today that gave you amazing answers. All of you that have said, I've got to support, I've watched the show today and I I want to sow a seed. Give us a call, 800-232-9855. Also, that's not just for sowing. You can call and say, I just need somebody to pray for me. That's what that number is there for as well. Again, that's 800-232-9855. You can write us at P.O. Box 1010, Marion, Illinois, 62959. Please go to our website. Anything that you need information on, it's there on that website, tct.tv. That's also a secure site. Or just text the letters TCT to 56512. I want you, even while we're doing so many shifts and things are changing here at TCT, please, 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 please tell everybody you know that we are still here doing the work of the Lord. Now, things may change. We may do it differently. We may approach it differently, but the work of the gospel of Jesus Christ remains the same. And that is what we are trying to do. Get it around the world. So thank you again for all your generous support and all of you that tell somebody about Jesus and what we do here at TCT. Again, I want to publicly thank my panel today, and I want you to tune in every time Ask the Pastor is on. And you know, we show movies, we show other programs. Please be committed to what's happening right here on on TCT. Until next time, God bless. Ask the Pastor is a TCT network production and is made possible by your financial gifts. If you have questions or comments, write Ask the Pastor, P.O. Box 1010, Marion, Illinois 62959, or email us at ask at tct.tv. Thanks for watching.